All right, everybody, I think we'll get started here. Sunday class at Sunnyside. New plants for 2021. It's always an exciting one to see what's coming out for the gardening season. I'm Trevor Cameron, our general manager here at Sunnyside. Thanks for joining us. I had Nicole, she's in the background. Good morning, everyone. She's always got that pretty picture behind her. I get the pallet wall. <laughs> Go rustic chic here in the classroom. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, this is a really fun class for me to do. Um, you know, one of the more interesting parts of my job is always kind of researching the year before, um, you know, what plants are coming out to market for gardeners? What do we want to stock at Sunnyside? Does it replace something we already carry? Is it something brand new we want to give a try? Um, you know, there's always new plants. That's one of the more interesting uh, things about the nursery business is we keep getting more options for our home gardens. Hopefully everybody got a chance to download the information sheet. It's on our website. Um, you can have a link to it as well um, on the class page. So you've got probably a 10 page list of everything plants. I always put way too much on there um, and we won't be able to cover all of it today, but I tried to pick a few highlights of the different categories we'll show you here in a slideshow and uh, let you know what's kind of coming in um, as we go through the season. One thing I'll say kind of before we start is, you know, not all these plants are here today, this hour on Sunday, March 14th. So as we go through the season, more and more of them will become available for us to purchase from our growers, which means you can come down to Sunnyside and purchase them for your gardens. So let us know, email us if there's something that caught your eye. We can certainly add you on to what we call our wish list here um, and give you a heads up as things come in. Uh, certainly a number of things you'll hear me mention are on, in stock already. Other things are spraying, lots more for summer. Uh, a few things won't even be out until fall, but we should have most of these items available here pretty quickly. Um, you know, one thing I thought before we showed some pictures is, you know, just kind of talking about how do new plants uh, come to the market? You know, how, how are breeders and growers, you know, who comes up with this stuff essentially? So, if you look at different categories, you know, new plants will come out a number of different ways. If I'm a shrub grower, you know, for example, Monrovia, you know, and I've got a massive nursery and I'm growing a thousand of something out in my nursery and one spring I walk out and say, wait a minute, that one plant looks a little different than the rest of them. Maybe I pull it aside, I see what it does. Is it a different cultivar? Is it worthwhile growing? You know, boom, I've got a new plant. A lot of things happen naturally in the plant world. Other things, you know, like perennials and annuals and roses um, are a little bit more of a painstaking process, you know, where people will be crossing pollens and mixing this rose with that rose to try to get a different variety and is it better and they go through trials. Um, and again, the winning, um, you know, breeds will come back to market and, and be available for us for home growers. A lot of times, you know, with conifers and Japanese maples and a number of other things, uh, we have what's called a witch's brood or a sport. You know, I'll look out on an old conifer tree and say, wait a minute, there's a branch growing out on up in that canopy that looks totally different than the parent tree. Then perhaps again, I can cut it, graft it onto something, and maybe I've got a, a new variety that's worthwhile for, for home gardeners. So lots of different ways these things happen. You know, the, the big thing for me is the why. You know, why, why should we have this new plant? Why does it replace something that we're used to? Um, you know, I'm kind of old school, so I like a lot of the old classics, um, but there's certainly some new plant varieties that come out that frankly should replace some of the old classic varieties. You know, what are the reasons? You know, is it more compact? Is it dwarf? Is it smaller? You know, there's a lot of, lot of new varieties of things that come out that maybe replace an existing variety, you know, take boxwood, for example, you'll see one on the show called Baby Jam. You know, I want the smallest, tightest, easy to grow boxwood. Well, there's an easy choice. This new one is much smaller than even our traditional dwarf English boxwood. If we look at, you know, a big one for us is more bloom. You know, does it flower more? Does it bloom a longer season? You know, there's another great reason to have a new introduction available for you, uh, for your garden. I want more flower power simply. Is it a different leaf color? You know, I personally am into a lot of foliages, big, small, different colors, variegation. You know, does that new variety offer a gold foliage or a red foliage or striped foliage? There's a lot of good new varieties that will become a new variegated or, or foliage, color, foliage color 
of an existing plant that you would already see. Um, a big one these days is disease resistance and insect tolerance. You know, is the variety a better in our climate, the Pacific Northwest against mildew, against black spot? You know, with the case of roses in particular, that's one trait we look for quite a bit. Am I gonna have to spray this consistently to keep it clean? Or is this new variety naturally better at fighting the th things off in our garden naturally? Um, insect is a great one too, you know, take birch trees you know, pretty prone to borer up here. A number of years ago, we started seeing new cultivars uh, introduced by tree growers that are bronze birch borer resistant or immune that I don't have to worry about the insect damage on and I don't have to spray. So a little bit easier to grow. Uh, do we want more berries? You know, things with edible plants. Um, you know, I always want most berries I could pick off my blueberry bush. So is it a variety that offers more production, a longer season? A different season you know there's lot, lots of reasons for that as well um, and then sometimes you know does it bloom on new and old wood is a huge thing makes it easier for you as a gardener to prune you can anticipate when the flowering seasons are but take a plant like hydrangea you know so many new great introductions of hydrangeas come out year after year after year they're trying to make your life easier as a homeowner that you don't have to worry about pruning it back too hard because they bloom on new wood or you're able to keep it smaller by pruning and not sacrifice the flower. So lot, lots of new introductions in that respect too. Uh, finally, I would just mention, you know, kind of the word nativar, and that's kind of a funny word in horticulture, but, you know, natives are always a big thing. Um, you know, we will have a small native defar department here at Sunnyside. We certainly can't carry all the native plants for um, our climate, but we do have a number of them around. And I think it's time to kind of designate that area Nativar is kind of the second level um, of natives. You know, man takes a native plant, again, hybridizes it, changes it some. Is it better disease resistant, a different foliage color, a longer bloom? All those same reasons, um, but is it still native? You know, and that's kind of the, the gist of that discussion between native and nativar. It's a cultivar of a native plant. Yes, it will offer some of the benefits uh, but would we, would we find it out growing native in the woods? No, we would not, but it grows just the same, maybe a little bit better. So that's another option for new plants as well. Now I'm gonna jump on here and show you a bunch of slides here, fast and furious. And then we'll do some questions, but I kind of wanted to give you a feel, a second, for what, you know, what we anticipate having here at the nursery as we go through the season, okay? So there's me, Sunnyside, that's our email address. If you go back and watch this, you can certainly email us at that address, which is also available on the website. We'll start out uh, by doing some perennials. Um, I think the list of perennials on my new list was substantial, um, but I tried to pick a few things out to kind of give you a little variation. Uh, first one there, is what we call hyssop or agastache, agastache. I've seen it pronounced a number of different ways. Um, you know, that's a great hummingbird perennial. I have some old ones in my yard. Most gardeners enjoy this. It's got a long season of bloom. Crazy Fortune is one uh, that offers variegated leaves. So there's a perfect example, the same looking hyssop we always have, but now we add a little bit of foliage interest. So before it blooms and later in the season after bloom, we would still have some attractive leaves to look at. So consider that plant for a nice hot dry spot, hummingbird, butterfly garden. It's a great one for pollinators and uh, gives you a little bit of herby smell in the foliage too. Very, very nice. Uh, Armeria is a great little rockery plant. I've had a number of different varieties of Armeria in my own south facing rockery. They're very drought tolerant. They're evergreen, tight little mounds of foliage. This new Dreamland series uh, kind of solves what I've always wondered, man, it would be sweet to have an armaria that blooms the entire season. So with this Dreamland series, we can do pink, we can do white, we can do a darker pink towards red. Uh, we do have some of these in starting to come in already. Uh, this is one that we would have consistent flowering starting mid late spring all the way through to fall. If we just deadhead uh, just a little bit, the little pin cushion flowers that come up We'll keep it from wanting to go to seed and we'll keep those flowers coming nearly year round. So that would be a much longer blooming selection. A couple of the stilbies, 
Um, these aren't necessarily new, brand new to the nursery trade. We've had a few over the last couple of years trickle in and trickle out, but I think this is the year they're finally much more available for home gardeners. If you like a still bee, some people call it false spirea. It's got a bunch of different names. It's a great, you know, woodland perennial. The bloom is nice, you know, in that May, June time frame. But to me, these two are about the foliage. I have both in my garden. Um, a chocolatey, ready purple leaf is really hard to do in shade. But that chocolate and shogun has got fabulous foliage on a nice shrubby type of still bee that will disappear every fall and come back up every spring. Very, very hardy. Uh, so the little light pink flower, I could leave it or keep it. It doesn't matter as much. I really like the foliage of that plant. The Amber Moon, I just picked one up last year finally, and we'll have a bunch of these in as well in the spring. Uh, this is one I would get that striking gold with a little even orangey cast to it on the foliage. Again, a light pink flower, but a nice shrubby upright it still be that's got great foliage color. That'll really brighten up a nice shade garden. Uh, some clematis. You know, I put them in with perennials because they are, but they're vines. You know, we know how clematis grows. Um, I just wanted to point out these two series of the Vancouver series of clematis are really good growers. You know, bred right up north of us in, in Vancouver, BC with the UBC Botanical Garden. We've had a number of different colors of these already available the last couple of years. The new one this year is the Sea Breeze, that nice light blue. All these, all these Vancouver clematis, very, very heavy flowering, large blooms fragrance on some which is really nice but very manageable in size you know a lot of the full-time clematis with similar colors to that you know hf young some other cultivars i've seen much larger plants i think most gardeners want a clematis that will stay in the six maybe eight foot range and cover a fence an arbor a trellis some kind of structure without going insane you know i've seen clematis that'll cover half a yard if you let it go um, you know, Vancouver Sea Breeze or that entire series would be great ones to look at for a manageable size um, that'll get that repeat flowering on from spring till fall. Nice long bloom season. The Boulevard series, the same way. Uh, lots of different colors available in this. Um, and I would say added, added on Boulevard is container grown. A lot of folks want to put a very nice pot out, put a little obelisk, a small trellis, and grow a very pretty vine in it. It doesn't have to be replaced every year. Boulevards are very hardy. We've got great drainage in a container. As long as we keep it fed, this is a little creature that would bloom again consistently from May, June, a skip a little bit midsummer, and then I'd have all flowering again in that August, September, early October time frame. So take a look at the boulevard. That's another great, great series of clematis. Uh, digitalis, or what we call foxglove, you know, a lot of fun colors coming out in foxglove. That's a great example of that Nativar term I used. I'm never going to find one with that pretty salmon-y, orangey, coral color flower probably out in the woods, but it's still foxglove. It grows the same. It's a great Pacific Northwest native. That Arctic, Arctic fox series will come in a, different, a few different colors again. We'll see these starting to come in here the next couple of weeks. A ferns. Some really fun ferns coming out the last couple of years. Uh, last year, you could come get your dinosaurs, the pterodactyl, uh, the T-Rex, on and on, if you like the Jurassic Park ferns. Uh, this year, Jurassic Gold. And again, being a foliage guy, I'm trying to brighten up my shade areas all I can. We've got Dreopterus, which is a great kind of wood-type fern. But now I add that golden orange new growth, which I think is going to be striking in the shade garden. We'll have these available here pretty quick at the nursery as well. Uh, some sunny perennials, uh, Gallardia, or we would call blanket flower. I've always been a huge fan of. Um, they're one of the best things for bloom May all the way until we get frost. I've got different varieties of this in different areas and sun in my own garden. And they bloom to me as much as an annual, but I've got something that will reseed itself and come back every single year as long as we've got good drainage. So the Lunar Series is the new new series out. We will have these available. Uh, you can get yellows, oranges, reds. These are your hot colors and combinations of both. So no pastels, but if you want to go bold with the summer sun colors, uh, Gallardi is a great choice for a nice little kind of wildflower. Works well in the perennial gardens. Uh, Gar is a great butterfly magnet. Now we get our pastel colors. Um, 
you know, my issue with Gara is sometimes they get a little big and a little bushy if you've got a smaller yard. And sometimes they might even have to stick them up a bit if we get a wet spring. Um, the new ones I'm seeing come out are much, much smaller. This baby butterfly is only going to be a foot tall. So I get the long blooming season, great pollinator action and butterflies um, on a much smaller scale type Gara. So again, dark pink, light pink, white, some different options on colors, but a great little perennial we could grow in a nice pot, as you can see in that picture, and have it come back every year or add it into a small little sunny perennial border uh, for a long season of color. Uh, Helleniums, as I'm choked up with my allergies here, they call this sneeze weed, but it really doesn't make you sneeze. I, I have this in my yard as well, and it's not so bad. Uh, the issue with sneeze weed is sometimes it's a little tall. Um, a lot of the old school uh, Helleniums got up there maybe three to four feet tall, which is great in some areas of the garden, but I frankly wanted this color on the border. I wanted something much more compact. So this Heyday series um, is the smallest one I've seen come out. We'll have these probably more towards early summer and then until the fall. But this is one, again, I can get the oranges, the reds, the yellows on a long blooming perennial that will start in June and go all the way till fall. So these weed flowers will typically be open for three months, which is just an incredible uh, length of bloom. I could not tell you how many bees uh, buzz around mine in the summer. This is a great one for uh, for the pollinators again. Uh, some things we have in now are hellebores. You know, this is our Christmas rose, things that are blooming this time of year um, into usually another month or so. We're getting towards the end, so don't wait too long on these. But just a couple series to kind of watch out for. Frost Kiss series, excellent flowering. The flowers are up a little bit more, not hanging down. And it has some very nice foliage as well. So we're not blooming in the later spring, summer, and the fall. We've got an attractive marbled or variegated leaf, some white, some pink on some. Take a look at the leaves as well, because they are quite nice. <coughs> the Ice and Roses series, same thing, nice foliage and heavy flowering. If we asked our growers, this is probably their favorite series of hellebores. If I want flower power, Ice and Roses red or white or Piketty, all the different colors um, probably bloom more than most hellebores do. So flower power, go for that Ice and Roses. Uh, some hookera, you know me, I got hookera itis, so I run the fan club for hookeras around here. Uh, we've already got a rainbow of colors in. These two quite, not quite yet, but pretty quick. Uh, we're always looking for new hookeras because I think they're a great evergreen perennial for foliage color and some nice flower. Uh, these are both really nice smaller varieties. Black Forest Cake will give me that dark, you know, kind of obsidian color foliage, but on a much smaller plant that I can use in a container garden for a nice accent plant or in my border of my garden for that foliage color and long season of bloom. Uh, Lemon Love is, I think, going to be the better lemony yellow kind of lime colored one for more shade type pucaras. A little bit of morning sun's okay, but we would want afternoon shade on those. Um, some of the yellowy, limey ones have struggled a little bit here with rust, some other issues in the Northwest. But I think this one, again, was bred more for disease resistance. So I think it's going to be the cleaner option uh, for the shadier container or shadier garden. Uh, lupins are always fun. You know, look at that flower. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lupins. You know, we would have native, mainly over in eastern Washington uh, in our state. But a lot of areas have wild lupins, a great little perennial that blooms in spring. Again, the bees, the pollinators. <coughs> Most of the varieties that are coming out are going to give you some serious color contrast. So the latest one here is the Staircase series, where you can see by the variety there, I'm going to pick two colors that pop off each other. So you're going to see orange with yellow and purple with white, and red with purple, and all these different color tones. Again, something we'll have in here pretty quick. Usually by mid-late April to early May, we would start to see a lot of the lupins in stock. I always mention Ito peonies in, in specifically in a new plant class because this is an old school plant, you know, that started out in Japan, you know, going back almost a century ago, but more and more cultivars are getting made or found in the Far East that we can introduce to our Western gardens. So Mr. Ito 
in Japan years ago figured out a way to cross tree peony with an herbaceous cottage bush type peony. So this to me is the best of both worlds. I have one in my yard too and it's spectacular where I get a huge flower, a lot of times fragrance like I would get on a tree peony, but on a much more manageable bush size that I don't have to stake. Sometimes tree peonies get a little brittle. We've got to worry about the branches snapping in the, in the spring rains and the wind, but this will give me the best of both worlds. So this year again, uh, no exception. We'll have probably 15 different Ito peonies available here for sale in a few weeks. Uh, some great color contrast. You can even get the yellows, the oranges, the reds. Um, there's some really fun flowers coming out this year. Uh, I might suggest looking for Raggedy Ann. You can probably guess what color. I won't tell you, but uh, we would have a few new ones like Raggedy Ann available. Uh, salvias, you know, again, are, <clears throat> excuse me, getting very popular uh, up in our Northwest gardens. With global warming, we don't have to worry as much about salvia death uh, that we used to because we are getting a little bit warmer in the wintertime. Um, there's extremely hardy salvias that we can grow down into the 20, 30 below range, and a lot of salvias that are right on that hardy line for our kind of northwest gardens. So if you've got good drainage, <coughs> excuse me, it's really the key. Uh, just do not want them to get too wet and you will be okay. Um, this Mirage series is a new one. We'll be carrying uh, lots of flower color options again. I believe I put the salmon one on there, but I can have purple, white, Red, rose, salmon, all the different colors in that salvia series. Um, salvias will start blooming about June all the way till frost. So I would expect we'd start to have a pretty good chunk of these about mid-May or so. Uh, the violas I put in there, uh, just because I think it's a fun one for winter. We're getting towards the, the end of kind of viola season right now. But this is a plant that I can purchase, grow in my garden, grow in a container, or use and transplant into kind of a part sun, part shade border. They will recede a little bit, makes a nice ground cover that will really bloom all year. But this Halo series, I think, had really nice contrast between the face, the flower, and some, some different color options again. Uh, some shrubs. If we look at some shrubs coming down the pipeline, uh, these are what we call budlia. It used to be called butterfly bush. I think now they're trying to make us say nectar bush or summer lilac, which I have a tough time not saying butterfly bush still, but I'll leave that up to you. Uh, butterfly bush, the big difference is our state uh, banned the old school butterfly bush because of how much seed they produce, choking out natives, taking over riverbanks. Um, so we can't have the old ones we used to get 10, 20, 30, many moons ago. Now we've got the same great attributes but no seed. So a little less maintenance for you, which is great. So the Buzz series started coming out last year or two, more and more colors again available. Uh, you got all kinds of fun ones from purple to cranberry to white to pink to every color. We would have a really good selection of the Buzz series here, I'd say probably early to mid-May, and we would have that into the summertime. Uh, Ruby Chip is the newest introduction out of this chip series of Budlia. Uh, from Proven Winners, their color choice shrub department. They do some great breeding on a lot of fun shrubs for the whole country, especially the, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Ruby Chip is the small one. So if I want a nice butterfly bush, I can tuck into my perennial garden without getting a big woody shrub like old butterfly bush. Uh, Blue Chip, Ruby Chip, Lilac Chip, all these little miniature ones are great additions to a typical, um, you know, average size garden. Uh, the big thing with butterfly bush is all summer color and fragrance. So I attract pollinators, I get butterflies, but I've got a great smell and bloom and a variety of color options um, that I don't have to do as much pruning and maintenance on. There's the baby gem boxwood I mentioned earlier. Very small foliage. We've had some in already. We'll be getting more of those. A uh, great choice just for an easy green shrub, hedge, you can clip it, you can leave it round, you can make an ice cube, do whatever you like for your shape. Uh, that's an easy one to maintain the size for your, for your own garden. Uh, I was pretty psyched about this osmanthus. Some people call this false holly, but osmanthus is not gonna have the berries like holly does, just great foliage. 
So Party Lights is a great name. If you like pink, white, and green, variegation, different colored foliage, that's an outstanding foliage shrub that does bloom in the fall. Osmanthus has a white fragrant flower. This would be blooming in the late fall, October, early November, right before winter. It's not a real big bloom that you'll go out and say, oh, wow, but you'll probably smell a little bit of it as it blooms along the wood. But Party Lights, great foliage color on something, again, I can clip and maintain size on. Uh, Rose of Sharon or Hardy Hibiscus, some great varieties of that coming down through the breeders. Uh, French Cabaret is a great uh, example from Bailey's uh, First Editions of, of nursery back in Minnesota, very hardy. A great Rose of Sharon if you like that midsummer flower. There's not a lot of shrubs we can buy that grow nice and upright, large shrubs, small trees even. Um, that would bloom reliably in that July, August time frame. That's when you get flower power right in the heat of the summer. Lots of color options. Uh, the, the French Cabaret uh, Double Purple is, is one of the new ones this year. Uh, some regular hydrangeas. Uh, I'll be honest as I smile, I love the names of these two. So we'll be having these this get to the summer. You know, wee bit giddy and wee bit grumpy. I think of the seven dwarfs. Maybe they'll come out with uh, all seven more here as the years come down. These are two other, two other options uh, from the Proven Winter Color Choice uh, Shrubs Department. Uh, hydrangea is a great example of a plant that is almost overwhelming the, the variety of choices these days. There's a lot of great hydrangeas to choose from. The big thing to know is all these new varieties or most of them that come out bloom on new wood and old wood. So it opens up you as a gardener to prune them however you want. You can keep them smaller by doing a nice March prune every year, they grow up and they still flower. Old school hydrangeas, we could not do that with, or we would get the leaves, but not much bloom that same season. So very manageable for size and a lot of flower color, again, all the way through summer into fall. The color change will always be on pH. Join me for hydrangea class later in the spring and we'll talk more about all that. A couple other new ones. Uh, Felicity will have in here probably a little later in May. Uh, that's an interesting double one that almost looks like a lace cap hydrangea, but it still grows in a mop head flower. I'm pretty psyched to check that one out. That's a new one for this year as well. And then Let's Dance would be another series out of the Proven Winter uh, Color Choice realm. The Big Bang is the one that's got the biggest flower. So that's the latest one out of that series as well. Oak Leaf Hydrangeas. A great summer color and awesome fall color if you like leaves in the fall. Uh, some great cultivars coming out again on these. Color Choice has introduced Gatsby Gal. We'll have this one in finally this year. Uh, this is one that we would have great foliage, nice big white cone flowers. It's not two different plants there. That would open white in summer. And as we progress through the summer season, light pink, darker pink, almost towards red when we get towards the fall. So same bloom will change color for you. Uh, Nandinas, you know, a great drought tolerant uh, foundation evergreen plant for a lot of areas of the country and including uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is a new series that has come out from Bailey Nursery. These were bred down in the south. So very heat tolerant, humidity tolerant, great disease resistance, but I get all the foliage colors I want. <clears throat> so first one here is Cool Glow Lime. That's exactly what it sounds like. I want lime, green, yellow, evergreen leaves on a nice, tidy, evergreen shrub that I can pop with some color. Use for foundation plant. Use as drought tolerant. A great little useful evergreen shrub. Cool Glow Peach. You know, I'm into the peachy tones. You want to get towards that kind of peachy, apricot, orangey color. That would be the one to choose for you. Finally, we got pomegranate. You know, I want to get towards that hotter fuchsia red color. I'm going to look for pomegranate. That's a very striking color. I'll have color on all three of those in the spring when they flush out growth. I'll still have color on those in the summer on the tips, and I'll have great color in the fall and winter. Those are all three, to me, year-round foliage changers. I will never drop my leaves, but I'll have nice evergreen color on the foliage. And all three of them, very manageable in size. I can prune Nandina very easily, but I'm expecting all three of these to be 
just in that three foot by three foot, maybe just a little taller, but very manageable with, with pruning. A raphiolepsis, that's a tongue full to say, right? Uh, that's a plant, you know, that I had when I lived down in California real briefly, because it wasn't the hardiest thing in the world, but at the top of the list for drought tolerance, this new variety called Redbird is plenty hardy to grow up here if you've got a good sunny, slope, well-drained area, no clay, and I don't want to water much, that might be a great choice for you. Um, I looked at this plant for disease resistance. The issue in uh, Western Washington would be like today, rain's beating on top of the greenhouse roof above my head here, and I don't want to fight fungal issues. This red bird is touted as being the most disease resistant cultivar. So we're going to try it this year. We'll have it in, I'm guessing, mid-late April. It's got great foliage color, kind of Fultinia-like, red new growth, nice white bloom in the summer. I don't have to water it much, and I think we'll have much cleaner foliage with this particular selection. A uh, new lilac, uh, little lady says everything. I'm sure you're picturing right now a nice little dwarf, easy, tidy lilac. That's the smallest uh, Korean variety I've seen come out. This was bred. Um, out of Minnesota, again, Bailey Nurseries, extremely hardy down to zone two, like 40 below zero. Oh, geez, I hope we don't get that cold around here. But I could grow that in a lot of climates, uh, very manageable in size. I still get the classic fragrant lilac flower, kind of that light lavender color, but on a very nice tidy plant, maybe four, maybe five feet tall by four feet wide. Very manageable for size. Some edibles. Uh, some of these, I, I hate to say, we got in in January and we're already getting sold out, but I'll show you a few here. Uh, you know, luckily we've got some great ag schools in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon State just south of us, Washington State and our uh, fine state of Washington is one of the best for introducing great new varieties of edibles. Sunrise Magic is one uh, that did come through Washington State University. It's only available for Washington gardeners, so if you're joining us from somewhere else, Sorry, you can't have one. Uh, it's one that we just stick stick with Washington on. So you might think of Cosmic Crisp. There's a bunch of other great ones. Sunrise Magic uh, would be a great new apple that we, that we do have in stock. Early Gold Pear is a new one for us this year because I wanted to find a pear that we, A, didn't have to wait till September, October to pick <clears throat> and might soften and ripen on the tree and be edible a little quicker. So Early Gold would be a great choice if you want to get a little bit earlier fruiting pair, more in that kind of latest August to mid-September time frame that I can probably pop off the tree and start eating very quickly. Uh, Crimson Passion Cherry was the new cherry for us this year. We do still have a few. Um, this is out of a extremely cold hardy kind of own root type cherry. They're naturally dwarf, very heavy crops on these and extremely high sugar content. That's probably the biggest difference between uh, these new cherries that are coming out is extremely sweet. So a great one to use for fresh eating. You can keep the birds from borrowing half of them. You, you probably do better than I do, uh, but certainly one that, uh, that, that that's worthwhile trying in the garden. Uh, Little Ruby Fig, I've done this talk for a couple of garden clubs back earlier this late winter, and everybody wants a Little Ruby Fig. They're not going to be out for a little while. Uh, if you want Little Ruby Fig, uh, send your name and we'll put you on the list. It might be a little bit of a wait because uh, there's it's quite a demand for it, but we're going to try to get all we can when they're available. Uh, this is the smallest fig I've seen. Um, fig is a big tree with a lot of root systems. We have to have sun. This is the one that I've seen that's going to stay down six or eight feet tall, give me a delicious fig that I could even feasibly grow in a nice container uh, versus even have to have in the ground. So if that's of interest, uh, email your name. We'll add you to the wish list. Uh, blueberry bonus, we do have in still. Um, I love blueberries. There's a lot of good varieties. The reason we brought this one in is, frankly, quantity of production. This would be the new world record holder for amount of berries on one plant at 14 pounds. So I think you're going to see a lot of the blueberry farms, a lot of home gardeners are grabbing these. I want good tasting berries. It's got that too, but I want quality and quantity. There would be your answer. Get a bonus and mix that in with some of your high other high bush blueberries 
So you get a massive amount of berries to, to utilize. Crimson Knight, uh, raspberry, we do have some still. Um, I thought this was an excellent newer raspberry with a little bit darker uh, berry, a little bit more manageable than some other raspberries. It's still a raspberry. It's going to sucker and grow like raspberries do. They're even saying this one might be the better choice for a large container grown or raised bed area that's a little bit more manageable than some classic raspberries. Uh, this is one that you'll get some sweet, delicious fruit on if you want to give it a try. Couple new strawberries, a uh, raspy berry. Uh, I didn't write the wrong word there. It does look strange, but it is a strawberry that has the flavor of a raspberry, which is quite interesting. I will be trying one of these this year. Uh, we have gotten some in uh, gallons and some four inch just came in yesterday. So that's one we do have ready to go. Um, if that interests you, considering how popular edibles are the last two years, I would get down here pretty quick and grab some because I don't know when they will run out and it will probably will be 2022 till we will see more of them. So raspberry berry, good new strawberry in the ground, containers, baskets, whatever you want to do with your strawberries, a great choice. Uh, berry treasure, uh, we'll have in here a little bit later in spring. Um, that one's got a great edible strawberry on it, but the bonus is that flower. Uh, most strawberry blooms, of course, are white. That one has got a really cool flower. We've had a lot of people have interest in maybe growing this as part of a container because it would hang, give a nice flower, and I can pick some fruit while I'm out watering um, or grow it in the ground, just like any other strawberry. Very, very easy one to, to grow. A couple trees. Uh, we've got uh, some new options. We just got just a couple of these in this year. They just came in. Uh, if you like paper bark maple, um, but like a more refined shape to it, so copper rocket is exactly what it sounds. I've got a nice concentric, narrower variety of paper bark maple that I get that beautiful peeling bark on uh, as a nice interest. Great fall color, very manageable in size for a, for a yard or a street tree. Um, certainly something taken a look at. <clears throat> a couple new Japanese maples. Uh, we have orange flame in uh, right now. Probably got 20, 30 plants around. That's it for the year. If you're a maple addict like I am, uh, come down and get one of those sooner than later because uh, they'll be gone for the year and we won't have those again for a whole other season. Uh, very manageable in size, some orange spring color and good orange fall color. I think that's got a pretty sweet color change as we go through the season. Uh, Cascadia, the first ones we just got a few trees in. We'll have more of these as we go through spring. And the fall, I think we'll have a bunch around finally. Um, this is part of this Pacific Rim collection. I would encourage you to Google that name, look at some options, um, especially if you're other side of the mountains in Washington or in a colder state. These are Japanese maples that were bred with Korean maple to give us increased hardiness, but still have the look of a Japanese maple, if that all makes sense. Um, they're fun trees. Really cool spring color, great summer color, awesome fall color, and some nice varying growth habits. Cascadia is the latest one uh, that's coming out. You can see a nice broad, low bushier maple with excellent orange fall color and a nice dissected foliage. Little bit looking like lace leaf, but it doesn't weep like lace leaf stubs. It, it'd be a little bit more shrubby than that. A uh, hibiscus, a uh, full blast. That's a big old blue flower. If you like your Hawaiian hibiscus that we can't grow here, you can't have red or orange or yellow, but I can have blues and lavenders and pinks and whites. We looked at the double flowering earlier. This is one that we get in on a tree trunk that would look like a flowering tree for summer. So if you like Rosa Sharon, that's the best blue one I've seen come out. We'll have these a little bit later. I'm guessing more like mid late May or so, we would have some big trees in to sell. This would be a great choice if you want a tree that blooms in midsummer. That's a great option for that. Uh, liquid amber, you know, sweet gum is always one of the best fall color trees in many parts of the country, including the, our, our Western Washington region. My issue with sweet gum was two things. It never kind of had a very central leader. If you're OCD, I like looking at my trees in the winter and I want structure. I want it to look nice and symmetrical. Um, you can see by the winter picture I put on there, very nice structure to this sweet gum. Um, and it doesn't turn brown 
after red and hold its leaves through the winter. That would be my other thing. Um, very good fall color change that will drop in the fall winds that I can rake up or use as mulch and not have to look out in January and February saying, please, will you drop those old brown leaves so I can start over again for springtime. Uh, some crab apples. I personally love crab apples. I think it's the best choice for a spring blooming tree, more so than cherry or plum. You get great bloom on them. It's not old crab apples with scab and mildew and the different issues that we fought. These are all trees that, again, have been bred out for disease, immune, or excellent resistance to all the issues we would have in the Pacific Northwest. Some great color choice options, some great growth habit options. Ruby Days we have in, that would give me a really nice dark leaf crab apple with that fuchsia flower without scab and mildew and the other typical issues we would have. Sparkling, <coughs> sparkling Sprite we just got in. Uh, that would be a really nice dwarf one. You can see the picture there, a parking strip, a driveway, somewhere where I don't have to have, excuse me, an overpowering size tree, something I can keep almost like a little lollipop. It kind of looks like one of those little blooming lollipops in there. The reason I like crabs is all the things I've mentioned, plus fruit. You know, I'm going to get a small little tiny quarter inch crab apple on those. Look like little Christmas lights, if you ask me. In the fall, and the early winter, the birds will love you for having them. To me, that's a great all season choice that adds the fall color and a nice little crop of berries that I can enjoy in my landscape in, in, the, in the fall and early winter. Some annuals, um, you know, geraniums are, you know, there's good classic geraniums around. Um, and I won't bequeath you if you stick with your Americana dark red or whatever your favorite color is, because I probably do the same thing in my yard, to be honest with you. But I'm gonna try some new annuals this year. When we do our pots here in another month or six weeks, there's always some great varieties of annuals out. Um, the breeders keep breeding and they get more colors and more options and different growth habits. Um, this Mojo series, I thought it's got a great name, but the Mojo series geraniums, I think will give you the classic zonal geranium look on a very vivid flower. Again, a little bit more compact, very heavy flowering. I can get, oh, I put orange and white on here. I can get light pink, dark pink, red, all the different colors I would want on a zonal geranium. <clears throat> but I think one, Again, a little bit later in spring, we're still too cold to put most of these annuals out. So you come down here, that mid to late April to early May time frame, you would see all these different annuals. Uh, that Rosalie Antique Salmon, I think is a pretty cool geranium. I'm gonna end up with one of those in one of my mixed containers for sure. Um, classic double geranium flower, really nice color on that one. Uh, Mimulus is what we call monkey flower. Um, you know, typically monkey flower is kind of monkey flower, to be honest with you. You come down, you see the flowers, like, oh, that looks cool. I like it. And you take it home. Um, this jelly bean series, I think it's going to be kind of fun. We'll have this in in a number of different color options. I can grow these in a little bit more shade sometimes and not all day sun. But I think the flower progression is what makes this unique. If I buy that one I picture there, as those flowers age, I'm going to get two, three other colors going. To me, I'm going to look at that in a container or along a nice sunny or part shady border and look at an annual that looks like I probably planted four different colors when I really just planted one. So I think a really nice, uh, fun kind of color changing flower on those new uh, jelly bean mimulus. Uh, Thumbergia, you know, we're getting nicer weather in the summer. It doesn't rain all year here. We get nice hot summers. Um, and this is a plant that loves heat. So if I'm looking for an annual type vine that I would get really good flower power out of, as soon as we get warm all the way through fall, I think Thumbergia makes a great choice. You can grow it in a pot, you can grow it on a little post, you can grow it on a little trellis in front of the kitchen window. Anywhere I've got good sun, I'm gonna get consistent flower power out of that all the way through summer, through fall. You know, this is a plant, <clears throat> you know, you come in and buy, a little four inch start, it's amazing that little plant will probably grow to six feet in one season. So it's not that you've got this little tiny thing and what am I gonna do with it? Get it attached to something to grow on and it'll grow fast and furious and bloom. Feed it real regularly and you'll be very happy with the flowering. Uh, lastly, we'll do some roses and I do still have all these roses. 
I apologize if you were at the Rose class a couple months ago because you probably got a little bit of these uh, new introductions in here. But I'm always happy at Sunnyside that we're able to trial roses a year ahead of time. I want to see how they do. We feed them. We don't spray them. So if I walk away, because you as a gardener will probably look me in the eye and say, yes, Trevor, I will spray it every two weeks and keep the black spot off, when you probably won't. So if we feed them and don't spray them, how bad is the black spot? How bad will the mildew be? Are they still salvageable? These were all good winners from last year that we tried that kept pretty clean foliage without having to, to do a lot of spraying and gave me the great classic rose bloom all summer to fall. I mean, let's face it, everybody wants a long blooming plant. And if you've got sun, there's nothing that's gonna bloom longer than a rose will. So if you can do a little deadheading and keep them fed, you're gonna have great flower and fragrance on, on doing some roses for the, for the landscape. <clears throat> so Enchanted Peace is a derivative off the old classic Peace Rose, a lot more pink, same classic rose, nice hybrid tea, uh, easy one to grow here in Western Washington. Uh, Fun in the Sun uh, might be the most fragrant new rose for this year. That's got classic old English rose smell, a uh, very heavy perfume on that one. And it's got that quartered kind of cabbage rose look that a classic English rose would have. So Fun in the Sun, great one uh, if you like heavy smell. That's a taller grandiflora. Uh, Golden Opportunity is the new climber this year that we added. Um, I think a little different color, a lot of yellow climbing roses, much more buttery yellow, sunny yellow, light yellow. This one to me gets towards that gold side of yellow, you know, towards the orangey half. I think this is going to be a real bright climber, an excellent grower again uh, for Western Washington with a little less disease prone. Uh, Knockout Petite, we've got these in and we'll probably get more of these grown. Our bare root crop uh, is back there ready to go. Um, just leafing out. <clears throat> this is the smallest uh, rose we have on the property. If I want a little color, not much smell to be honest with you, but I want that good color, that would be the miniature shrub form in the knockout family. So I can get a small pot, have this on the deck in a sunny location, have great flowering all summer like I would on an annual, but now I've got a shrub that I can have year after year after year. Uh, painted porcelain. I think the picture on that one speaks for itself. That's a great silvery pink with that cream uh, on the backside of the petal. So great two-tone look to that rose. A nice fragrance on it as well. I think a really good new hyper tea. Uh, Perfume Factory uh, is, is aptly named. I'm guessing you can guess that one smells very nicely. And it's a little bit different color. That picture is not doing it justice. I think it looks more pink. It's a very nice kind of plummy towards the purple side of pink, which is not one we get in a lot of hybrid tea options. So nice color and heavy fragrance on, on Perfume Factory. Uh, Playful Happy Trails. You know, we've added that in this year with our other Happy Trails members. We can start singing the song, but I'm terrible, so I won't. Um, happy Trails to you, right? So ha Playful is the new color. It's going to be red with that yellow center. We've got three other color options in that same series. The gist with Happy Trails is a ground cover rose. I don't want a shrub. I don't want tall. I don't want huge. I frankly don't want a dead head. That's the other benefit with the Happy Trails. I just want to plant a rose in sun. I want it to eat up some ground. I want color all summer and I don't want to go out and deadhead it. Look at Happy Trails. That's a great choice for a bank even, a sunny border, a nice hot spot in the garden where you want summer color, not necessarily heavy fragrance. They do have light smell, but I want the color. I wanna look out and see that blooming all summer. Check out the happy trails. Uh, sitting pretty, again, heavy, heavy fragrance on that one. That would be another one, kind of in that English uh, type rose, taller grandiflora that I would get some really good smell from on a really nice pink. That's a nice upright one uh, that we do have available, uh, ready to go now too as well, okay? Uh, I think this is the last one, Sunset Horizon. So this is the Florabunda we added in. And we say Florabunda, we want a bouquet of roses, not a long stem single. Again, I wanna look out in the landscape 
and see big bouquets of flowers on my rose blooming all summer long. Sunset Horizon, I put two pictures on because I think this is one that, again, gives you that contrast. If it's in bud, it looks like the yellow with the orange tip. Once it's open, I get the kind of sunset pink and apricot and some of the other colors mix in as well, even a little red. Um, I think that's a fun one if you like the hot, the hot colors. So there you go. Way too many plants in way too little time, right? So hopefully those pictures kind of gave you, you know, you know, spark the interest. I know it's raining today. We've had great weather this week, um, but I'm sure there's something that caught your eye. Feel free to email, stop down. Like I mentioned, we do have some of those available now, and we will have others as we get through the spring season here. Now for the class, hold on, turn my menu off. For the class here, like always, we've got a little discount going. Um, so starting today through Friday, kind of not knowing what was coming in and when it was, it's really hard to kind of do a plant discount for this class. So we made it real easy and put two of our most popular items on special. Sure Start from EB Stone, the best organic transplant fertilizer. This is the time everybody's plant moving things around. We've got that on special 20% off all week, the small bags and the 15 pounders. So take advantage of that. And every gardener needs compost. It's always all about soil. So we've got our EV Stone uh, organic planting compost on special as well. The bags or the big compressed bales, buy three, get one free. So that's a great price here uh, for the week you wanna come down and take advantage of as well, okay? Just as a quick reminder before we do some questions, um, we, I'm staying home next weekend for my last weekend at home until probably July, um, but we will have classes again in two weeks. So Saturday, March 27th, uh, Holly is the queen of vegetables around here, and she will be pontificating about spring gardening with vegetables. So we'll have a great selection of spring veggies in. Come to join the class if you're doing edible vegetable gardening. She's excellent uh, with vegetables. And on that Sunday, the 28th, you'll get to listen to Boring Me again talking about weed control. So we're going to talk about spraying, different ways to control different types of weeds in our yard, lawns, gravel, driveways, just about everywhere. So join us if you're interested in learning a little bit about herbicides on Sunday the 28th, okay? With that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole here and we'll see if we can do some, some uh, questions for you. We've been pretty quiet today, so we don't have any questions kind of waiting on you. Um, if there are things that pop up or you realize you wish you would have asked, uh, please email us or give us a call. Trevor's going to be here, you know, the rest of today and he's here a lot. And, you know, there's lots of other experts on staff too. We're happy to chat with you about issues you may have going on or certain plans that he talked about today that you really like and want to get more information on or when it's coming in. Um, give us a call, shoot us an email, and we'd be happy to chat with you. If not, we hope to see you back two weekends from now and uh, in the nursery sometime soon. The weather's been really nice for us. So yeah, hopefully we get to see you down around the nursery. Stay safe, everybody. Enjoy the day today.